Good day and welcome to CDI Talks. My name is Anton Shkhavtsov and I'm the chair of the Center for Democratic Integrity, an Austria-based NGO that analyzes attempts of authoritarian regimes to influence politics and societies in Europe. My guest today is Andras Deak, a senior research fellow at the Institute of World Economics of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Andras Deak's research fields cover the EU and post-Soviet energy policies, Russian and post-Soviet economies, and the Eastern Partnership of the European Union. His activities include foreign and energy policy analysis, political and corporate consultancy on Hungarian, and some civil activities in energy conservation. I talked to Andras in Budapest as I wanted to hear his views on Hungary's economic and political relations with Russia, as well as Hungary's official and unofficial positions on the Russian aggression against Ukraine. I hope you will find our conversation interesting, and if you do, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated on future episodes of CDI Talks. Andres, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I would like to ask you, you know, today uh, Hungarian Foreign Minister Petra Siarto uh, posted on his Facebook saying that he was flying to Sochi to take part in the, uh, in the forum organized by the Russian company um, Atom Expo. And uh, he says that it's one of the most important meetings in the area of nuclear energy. But 15 years ago, one could hardly imagine that a Fidesz politician uh, would be welcoming business deals with Russia in general and also nuclear deals uh, with Russia in particular. Uh, could you describe in brief the evolution of um, Hungary's approaches to Russia uh, with a specific focus on the uh, energy supplies and uh, nuclear deals. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to you, Anton. Well, indeed, so until 2010, it, uh, Fidesz very much looked like as a normal Central European right-wing party, especially in terms of its Russia policy. They were loyally critical about um, Russian Russian actions uh, provided a very uh, pursued a very Russia skeptic attitude, and when they um, went into government, there was a total uh, change um, in in less than four years. Let me say so. Um, they became one of the most uh, that's so-called Russia pragmatic. Uh, political party in the region. At the same time, I think it, this, this, this turn had several stages. We don't have all the time to, um, to, to look through, but when it comes to Russian energy, we have to more or less understand the Fidesz basic attitude uh, towards power. So in 2010, it was quite obvious that I think uh, Orban would like to remain in power uh, for for a longer period, so they were speaking about twenty years, two decades, something uh, so, something similar. So the plan was already that the domestic policy has to be transformed in a way institutionally to enhance such a long stay in power, um, and that's why for them it was very important to have a two third majority. Um, they got it, uh, so they <clears throat> they had a free hand. Uh, in a forest transformation. So there was a very strong feeling that, of course, uh, this kind of transformation will lead to conflicts uh, with um, Western democracies. Uh, but it was quite obvious that in the foreign policy um, arena, um, they don't want to go into a two-front war with Russia on one hand and with the West at the same time. That, that was one element. The second one, even more important, that for Fidesz, two things matter. The one thing is, is their political rule. And it became quite obvious that um, three big players can influence uh, this. This is the US, uh, in one way or another, uh, maybe Germany. And uh, Fidesz also had the experience through the Jobbik that Russia is ready to intervene into Hungarian domestic policy. There were two possible reactions to that. The one way is to be very, very highly critical towards Russia, uh, to, to, to make a front against, uh, against Russia, but then you need Western support. Uh, and this was because of the domestic policy plans of, of Fidesz was not that easy. Um, so the, the other way, and this was the easier way in many regards, to become the biggest friends among all parties. 
uh, of Russia. And there was the other, other attitude that this country, in terms of, of, of uh, foreign policy and foreign economic ties, is very much opportunistic. So, um, for example, the, as you may know, the, the Hungarian foreign ministry is called Ministry of Foreign Trade and Affairs. Oh, sorry, Foreign Affairs and Trade, but in Hungarian, the trade is the first one and only comes the affairs. So, or, or, fine, or, or foreign minister, definitely, I don't hear making statements about security matters or about NATO or about like global importance. What, what he's speaking of is gas supply, energy supply, uh, new investors coming to, to Hungary. And this is the basic mission of the ministry since 2014. The, the attitude was that, okay, we've got, we've got the EU support already, we are there. The EU funds are coming uh, unconditionally in those years. Um, that's what we have, uh, and we have to add something, and this is where, where we are looking, looking for in, in, on the east, in Saudi Arabia, the, Turkey. Uh, turn to the, to the east, the opening to the east. Uh, opening to the east, China, maybe, and of course Russia. And in those years, Russian market was not that bad, actually, in terms of prospects, until 2014, definitely not. Um, and of course there was energy. Energy also became important in terms of the basic propaganda uh, on the domestic front. So the economy, the industry needs cheap energy and at the same time the households has to be supplied with cheap energy at least on the regulatory level and some sort of, some sort of political setup has to be created. Uh, well, that, that it's me who, who provides you stability on the price front. The, later on, of course, some elements disappeared. For example, there is no positive market uh, prospects in Russia anymore. Um, but energy was stable enough to remain there. Of course, you cannot exclude that there is some sort of conspiracy behind. There, there is the argument uh, that Putin blackmails uh, Orbán somehow. Um, I don't think that at such a high level it matters that much. Uh, so you can get after after a while you can get rid of such uh, blackmailing elements. I think that even without this blackmailing element, the the basic patterns of the Russian Hungarian energy relationship are there. So I can I, I think I can understand the government. In 2014, you argued that the Hungarian nuclear deal with Russia involving the construction of two nuclear blocks at the Paksh uh, nuclear plant uh, offered a certain chance of profitability, yet still you thought that the deal was a project with obscure past and a murky future. So what's your assessment of, the, uh, of this nuclear deal uh, about constructing two, uh, two more uh, nuclear blocks? Mm -hmm. What would you think of it eight years uh, later. Well, I, I think we are still suffering uh, the consequences of, of those years. That, but they are not, but they are actually not built yet. Not built yet. The project was not prepared accordingly and there were several questions left open. We contracted those units and then after we start to prepare the project. That's, that's what happened in the last eight years, uh, in my understanding. So I was critical to the project in two ways. The one is that I don't think that in 2014 this decision was necessary. I would have postponed, and, and, and well, the evidence is that after eight years nothing has happened. Uh, sure this, more or less. And the second uh, argument against that it was politically motivated rather than policy motivated step. So on the policy level, this was not well uh, prepared. So there was no tendering, that's a pity. Uh, this was uh, negotiated in a total secrecy. In this regard, uh, we lost a good deal of transparency and, and, and collective wisdom, let me say so. Um, regimes both in Russia and, and in Hungary can be described as illiberal, though there is obviously a huge difference between uh, Putin's aggressive authoritarianism and Orban's declared liberal, illiberal democracy. What's the relationship between ideological and pragmatic aspects in the Hungarian-Russian relations? There is uh, a lot of to discuss for the two leaders besides business and, and pragmatic issues. We always forget to 
think about the ego. Uh, and Orban, in many regards, um, uh, uh, has, a, has a very strong ego. I think it is as an explanation of his anti-mainstream policies to, to a large extent, that he, he cannot walk with the others. So he is personally, psychologically an anti-mainstream uh, person. If there is a, the push that something should be done, he definitely will not do that. This is an explanation for, for his anti-mainstream attitude and this has to be very well understood that this anti-mainstream attitude is very well uh, welcomed in, in Moscow, let me say so. I don't think that there is too much trust uh, between the two leaders. I don't think that there is too much personal harmony in their relationship. Uh, I think that the, the, the basic designs of their, their policies are very similar to each other. Criticism of the West, anti-mainstream policies, um, attitude for, 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 for this kind of very harsh, realistic uh, view of world matters. And that's why he can, he can get guarantees in certain situations. That's why he can currently hope for that in the very end, uh, Hungary will be supplied with natural gas, uh, even if all the other countries are cut off for natural gas. Perhaps one of the most important areas um, where Orban's stances towards Russia is widely criticized in the EU is the ongoing aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, do you see differences in Orban's attitudes towards Moscow before February this year? Uh, so starting from 2014, from, with the annexation of Crimea, with the war in, in the Donbass, and after the beginning of the full-blown invasion in Ukraine in February. I think a lot of things has changed, not that publicly. Uh, we started from a very low basis, both in, in relations with Russia and in relations to, towards Ukraine. So as you may know, the Hungarian-Ukrainian relations are far from the past. And still they are very bad, but a lot of concessions have been made since, uh, since the story started. But also the expectations increased. There are some distinctive uh, measures why Hungary is different than, than the rest of Europe. The one is that we still have this uh, gas relationship and energy relationship with Russia. And the other one that we have some non-actions uh, regarding Ukraine. We don't don't deliver their arms, and we have um, a threat of veto. So from the Hungarian perspective, I think that, that uh, the one thing is that definitely if the Russians got the gas at the, this moment, then we, we can substitute it. So that's um, definitely you should not expect a radical change right now. It will take time, even if the decision has been made, but I don't see the decision that we walk away from the Russian gas. Uh, second, that uh, there is not too much returns, benefits from changing sides. Problem with the, with the Ukraine and Hungarian relationships that the Ukrainians want a full turn of Hungary and, and there, is, it's, it's, there is no benefit for that. So there is not too much rational to stand in the line of the full supporters of Ukraine at the very last place. At the same time, we lose the best friend of Russia, number one uh, place. So you have to take all the retaliation from Moscow and you get nothing practically from the Ukrainian side. So what the Hungarian government does is uh, tries, to, tries to doing is a number of small steps towards Ukraine. But Ukraine, from the Ukrainian perspective, that's not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. And in the EU and, and other relations, um, of course, there is a very narrow space between what the Russians want us to do, of course, in exchange, what and the West want to do uh, with us. So it's, I think this is um, more narrow and narrow and I don't know how long we can stay in this positions and uh, whether they will have to change the strategy I think they will have to um, and at the same time of course there is this whole issue with the EU money uh, so practically Hungary is running out of money 
we don't get the EU funds, uh, energy imports uh, prices are very high. If the situation remains such, and this is not only valid for Hungary, but valid for, for all the regional countries, in two years time, the country can go almost bankrupt. Uh, you already mentioned that uh, hung uh, Hungary has arrived uh, to a decision to not supply, uh, to not provide military assistance to Ukraine. And uh, well, this is hardly surprising. This decision is not really surprising, but it's still at odds with, uh, with NATO. And also probably even more importantly for Hungary, it's at odds with the other three countries of Visegrad 4 yeah, bloc. Um, don't you think that this decision and uh, Hungary's attitudes towards Russia would somehow damage its reputation in Europe and also among um, the uh, Visegrad 4 countries? As I mentioned, reputation does not matter for the regime as long as there is no tr um, transformation into financial or economic matter. The, there were two, two moments, the, uh, three moments. The first moment there was an importance on the foreign policy arena to Moscow that we are not like the European ones. This, this was number one. The second one that it was an electoral campaign in Hungary in, in those days. And um, well, the opposition argued that we have to follow the European path. And uh, Orban's main message was that we have to keep out of the military conflict. And it worked actually. So Orban had the two-third majority. And the third element, you have to understand that unlike the other countries and many other countries where at the, at, at the romantic phase, I think it was spring 22, there was a, an upheaval, a moral and ethical upheaval that something has to be done uh, in order to stop Putin. Orban did not have such a necessity. So he controlled... What about the society in Hungary? Uh, look, we had before the war, uh, we had an opinion poll. Uh, every two years we make a threat uh, uh, perception, a public opinion poll, what, are, what the Hungarian population is afraid of. And there is the question whether you are afraid that the country will be militarily attacked by another country. Um, so more than a thousand people. Guess how many said, yes, I have such a fear. In, in percentage? Percentage. Maybe 20. Mm -hmm. Four. We also asked which countries, Romania, well, there was Russia, China, Romania, US, Germany. So uh, these, these were the crazy ones. Especially in the Fidesz electorate, there was no clarity about the, the responsibility. So the bulk of the people think, uh, like in other Western countries, that Russia is an aggressor. That's okay. At the same time, and this is funny, as I suppose in the Fidesz electorate, Ukraine, the assessment of Ukraine hasn't in, uh, improved. So if you, if, if you look at the, the polling, um, the, the attitude towards Ukraine is, is rather cold, and this hasn't improved that much. Uh, basically remained at the same level. So we are, became more critical towards Russia, it's visible, uh, both in the Fidesz electorate and the opposition, definitely, even the neutral ones. But this is, we also remained uh, very critical against Ukraine, and this hasn't improved. But I think that it's, it's partly a result of maybe sort of even anti-Ukrainian campaign of Fidesz, yes, yes, or at yes. least Fidesz-controlled media. Partly anti-Ukrainian, uh, partly not empathic. All, all, those, all those discussions, uh, about the the war are from a strategic perspective. The human is not visible behind all the stories. Andras, and my final question, against the background of the ongoing Russian ag aggression against Ukraine, um, what would be your recommendation recommendations to the Hungarian government? What should it do? What should it focus on? What I'm saying usually for this is that Okay, you don't want to close the Russian energy portfolio right now, but please open a Western one. So let's at least uh, try to think about how to diversify supply as the others do. Slovakia contracted a lot of natural gas import um, uh, capacity. Czech, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, definitely Austria uh, has uh, started to import Qatar gas, 3BCM. 
Germany, Italy will be fully diversified away from, from Russian gas by 2000, 2024. Um, so the first and, and most critical step, at least to establish, I, I'm not saying that we have to drop the, the Russian gas, but we have to establish the technical feasibility to import uh, the same amount, the necessary amount from other sources. Um, and that's the matter where we should start with. I think if we start, do, so, so the problem is that we don't offer a prospect. You can argue that, okay, now you understand I'm in an emergency situation, I cannot risk a conflict with the Russians now. But we don't make a promise that in two years we will be able to step away from that. So what the first step would be that give a conviction that we will at least be able uh, to stand aside from the Russians and we will be in a situation when we cannot be blackmailed by energy or anything else. And this is the, 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 the pledge, what is very much missing at the moment. So that's the thing where we have to, to start with, because if we don't make it a step, any kind of concessions we make to, to the West uh, will be considered as temporarily and the Russians can make, make reverse. And then the second uh, aspect, if we have the strategic autonomy, because we don't have it now fully, uh, if we get back our strategic autonomy and energy matters, then we can consider what should be done uh, in the longer run. Uh, so my basic concern that we are losing our strategic autonomy, we will get stuck behind the West and Russia, and we cannot leave this sphere and in this regard it can be very risky uh, if things turn badly uh, in the future. Thank you very much for the conversation Andras. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs>